Hi, my name is Pallavi Pratap and thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. Do subscribe to it. Today I'm going to talk about insolvency and bankruptcy code and it is my endeavor that in 2022 we at least are up to date specifically as far as January is concerned with most of the important judgments that were pronounced by the Honorable Supreme Court in 2021. Now I would want to take it um, forward in terms of specifically looking at different topics. So for instance, today I'm going to talk about acknowledgement of debt or acknowledgement of liability and the interplay of Limitation Act with the IBC. Last year, actually, we saw that there were three very important judgments that came. One, of course, was Seshnath Singh. The second one is your ARCIL versus Vishal Jaiswal. And the third one being Dina Bank versus Shivshankar Reddy. I feel that, you know, we should be looking at these three judgments to understand the interplay between the Limitation Act and what it is, the ratio that has been held by the Honorable Supreme Court. So without much further ado, let's get started with Seshnath Singh versus Bedibati Cooperative Bank. Let me briefly take you through a timeline um, so that you understand exactly what had happened in this matter. Now, the corporate debtor is the appellant in this case uh, before the Honorable Supreme Court. The appellant had um, applied for a cash credit facility with the bank, which, who is the respondent and the financial creditor. Now, uh, the cash credit facility was granted to him, but this was sometime in February of 2012. In March of 2012, the first default occurs and therefore sometime in January of 2014, the financial creditor issues a notice under Section 13.2 of the Surface e Act. Now finally, if you see the Surface e proceedings, you would realize that there is a stage where um, 13.4 notices are uh, issued where peaceful possession is required to be handed over. Now these surface proceedings were going on uh, when the appellant approached the Calcutta High Court in a writ petition and the entire proceeding was stayed. This was in 2017. Now you have to realize the timeline 2012 is when the first default occurs. By this time uh, IBC had come and one was able to see especially the financial creditors could see that this was a a very effective tool to realize their uh, debts. So therefore, in 2018, the financial creditor started with the Section 7 application, which was filed before the NCLT uh, Kolkata. Now, uh, this, of course, was an application which was made by the financial creditor. And when the appellant, who is the corporate debtor, um, was there in order to reply um, for this application. The first and the biggest, I feel, uh, uh, the problem that occurred was that they did not challenge the said application on limitation. So therefore, in the entire argument that took place as far as NCLT or the adjudicating authority was concerned on the specific Section 7 application, there was no argument which was made on behalf of the corporate debtor saying that you know the section 7 application was um, beyond the limitation period which is prescribed. Now while the application was pending before the adjudicating authority uh, the section 7 application um, moratorium was declared and IRP was appointed and interestingly of course, once the moratorium is declared and IRP is appointed and Section 7 application is basically admitted, um, no argument, like I said, was made as far as limitation is concerned. Once this order was passed, the, um, the appellant or the corporate debtor here then goes and appeals before the Honorable um, NCLAT. Now, the Honorable NCLAT, when the arguments are being made, it is for the first time that uh, this argument was taken that the entire application was barred by limitation and it was completely against the article 137 of limitation act. Um, it was barred because it was with some five years of delay when a limitation actually as we all know runs for about three years. It can't be more than three years and then you basically lose your right. So 
when it came to Article 137, and this was the first time in the appeal that the um, that this argument was being brought up, um, the Honorable NCLAT dismissed the um, the application. Or sorry, the Honorable NCLAT then dismissed the appeal, saying that it is for the first time that this has been brought um, into the notice. And also that, you know, the NCLT never had the opportunity to weigh in this argument. Therefore, the uh, appellant then um, preferred an appeal before the Honorable Supreme Court challenging the order of the NCLT. Now, you have to remember this, that there are two concurrent findings against the appellant as far as this matter is concerned. And also specifically that an important argument with respect to jurisdiction, with respect to whether or not an application can be entertained, was only made at the first appeal stage and not before that. Now let us broadly examine the arguments which were made by the corporate debtor and also uh, by the financial creditor. The corporate debtor actually made an argument with respect to, of course, the limitation, saying that the limitation actually does set in and that even if there is uh, you know, a, a limitation that applies under Section 5 of the Limitation Act, that can be condoned. Now, an appropriate application was, of course, required to be made in order to have that condoned. And since there was no application, therefore, such a delay cannot be condoned. The second and major argument, I feel, was with respect to Section 14 of the Limitation Act, specifically the explanation which was provided in Section 14. Now, Section 14 uh, explanation says that it is only when one proceeding ends that you can actually agitate uh, your right. Um, so, primarily in order to compute the limitation period, all you have to do is to see that Let's say if you were uh, agitating your right ag against someone in a wrong forum, um, it is only when the, the entire proceeding ends that you can actually go, you have to basically withdraw your proceedings over there and then agitate your right in the other forum. You cannot, of course, use um, IBC as a mechanism for recovery of debt or uh, you know, a recovery mechanism, so to say because obviously there were surfacey proceedings which were going on before. And also another interesting argument that was taken up was with respect to whether or not, you know, uh, and this was actually being argued um, in the Calcutta High Court, where um, there was an entire proceeding and the entire uh, proceeding which was going on only to understand whether or not surfacey act actually applies on uh, cooperative banks or not. So these, these, are, these were different parallel uh, proceedings which were going on and these were different arguments that were taken by the corporate debtor. Now here, uh, the financial creditor of course said that, you know, because we were always agitating our right before another forum that essentially meant that we were not sleeping over our right. We were basically before another forum and it is only when this uh, court came into existence and we saw that we can use this code in order to, um, you know, have our debt um, provided to. Why don't we go ahead and use this forum because this is a more apt forum. Now, uh, all of this uh, argument was going on before the Honorable Court. And um, this, this was um, a bench which was headed by Honorable um, Justice uh, Indira Banerjee. And she's the one who's written it and beautifully written judgment in terms of how she essentially uh, looks and balances the uh, entire Limitation Act and how it is applicable as far as IBC is concerned. And this is basically one judgment which forms the basis for all the subsequent judgments that have come up as far as limitation is concerned. So let us now try and understand the exact crux of this judgment. The first and the foremost thing that this judgment actually looks at is a, a sort of a purposive interpretation. Um, it is a very constructive uh, way of, you know, trying to fill up the apparent gaps that are visible um, sometimes when um, legislative interpretation is required to be made. And in this case also, I think the first and the foremost 
objection that um, the financial uh, sorry the the appellant had raised was with respect to why not file a section 5 application for condonation of delay so in this judgment uh, uh, it is very interestingly observed that you know the court has the inherent power or has the power to actually condone the delay without even such an application being made and therefore it was not at all necessary that a section 5 application on the limitation act should have been made the second important point was with respect to section 14 and the explanation which was provided that if that an other um, you know an application with respect to another proceeding that you have to make can only be made when the previous proceeding where a wrong forum was there and therefore you were going through with a separate proceeding you were you are required to first finish off that proceeding uh, before the wrong uh, the wrong forum and come to the correct forum and then only that specific uh, time period upon which um, you were you know sort of looking at adjudication in so called wrong forum can then be um, condoned now uh, when you look at all of this a very interesting um, observation has been made as a matter of fact it is the ratio which says that um, that you know any explanation given uh, in the section would only uh, mean that it is trying to explain what the section could mean but it does not necessarily change how the section is worded so an explanation is only um, sort of an um, you know um, an understanding of the section but those words cannot be read to be part of the section or can be considered to be um, what the legislature uh, intended it to be so therefore when we look at section 14 and we see its application specifically as far as present case is concerned um, with respect to when we see that you know that the period where uh, a right was being agitated before the wrong forum uh, that could be condoned and that could be done away with now um, another very important point as far as um, this judgment was concerned was with respect to limitation and also uh, looking at it from IBC's perspective. What is important for uh, us to note is that the moment there is a debt which becomes due and payable and if you are agitating your right therefore and, if you, and most importantly you are not sleeping over your right to agitate to get that debt back if you are agitating your right and there is enough evidence to um, fill up that gap then definitely you can approach the adjudicating authority and you can invoke the insolvency resolution process so i feel personally that this judgment which looks at surface act uh, uh, is essentially something which we see increasingly that you know during that period of time a lot of these financial creditors had done and most of these appeals were pending and in light of this judgment that sort of clarity came in i hope you like this uh, video i hope it makes a little bit more sense in terms of understanding seshnath singh um, in a crux if you have any questions you can definitely leave it um, in the comment box below do subscribe to my channel do share this video and if there are any improvements that you feel that i should make do write in to me and I'll be very happy to address. Thank you so much for your time and I hope you have a good day.